I've seen a lot of guys crush estrogen throughout their entire cutting phases or contest preps because they think that is inhibiting their fat loss when in reality it's the f***ing opposite. What's up guys, Derek, marplatesmartates.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about the importance or lack thereof of estrogen. There is a um, you know, ongoing debate in the bodybuilding, hormone replacement, optimization, like a bunch of different subsects of you know demographic that overlap with you know testosterone, aromatizing to estrogen, the use of TRT, aromatase inhibitors, gear, aromatase inhibitors, etc. And there's an ongoing debate about if aromatase inhibitors should be used, their detriment and or lack thereof, and exactly what estrogen even does, because you know we've often heard things like you know it's the cause of uh, you know weight gain or it's you know the female hormone is just going to give you tits, that sort of thing. But in this article, we actually get into the true elucidation of its effects with other variables managed. And we've talked about estrogen's importance before. I did a video about testosterone is not neuroprotective, estrogen is. This is a very, very interesting study that almost no one saw. This is back when I got a lot less views and this video in general is just a very information heavy video, but they actually assessed the effects of neurotoxicity as a result of testosterone use in different dosages, nandrolone in different dosages, winstrol in different dosages. I forget what other anabolics, those might've been the, the few, but you could see a essentially dose dependence response in neurotoxicity, but this was regardless of the compound selected, it was due to the estrogen at a physiological level. There is a layer of neuroprotection offered against the neurotoxicity of escalating super physiological doses of androgens. And again, even at like borderline, I don't know, therapeutic levels for things that are synthetic, it seems like, you know, there's some potential neurotoxicity outcomes and some of this might be attenuated by the neural protection that estrogen offers and this is why with testosterone when you look at the graphical representation of its neurotoxicity as well as when you administer um, anastrozole also known as arimidex you see a complete attenuation of it essentially. So like here when we have this low, more so physiologic representation of testosterone plus anastrozole, we have NMDA toxicity and this, this dose escalation as well. Again, you can't really compare this to human like production necessarily. This is a model that is not really based off of like, a, you know, in vivo subject that is, you know, administering a dose dependent dose of testosterone like this study is, which we're gonna get into shortly but you can see the effects still extrapolated out and represented in a pretty definitive format here um, in vitro. And then further into the study, we looked at the administration of anti-androgens as well to assess if this was actually androgen-induced toxicity and flutamide was able to attenuate the neurotoxicity of synthetic anabolics, which was otherwise essentially counterbalanced with physiologic estrogen levels. So ultimately there is like evidence to support that estrogen does essentially have like a yin and yang effect a little bit with testosterone and it has a counterbalancing neuroprotective effect on the effect androgens directly have on um, neurons and whatnot so and in addition from like an actual practical aspect and you know i'm kind of trying to hit all different factors here muscle building fat loss erection quality sexual function etc and we're going to get into the human data pretty shortly this was how i feel personally with low versus high estrogen levels um, and this is kind of like just a good way to, obviously blood work is key and ideal, but also symptoms, you know, very, very prudent to go by symptoms as well. Like if you wake up and your dick is not working, like you don't have morning wood and you have erection, dis erectile dysfunction all the time. Like obviously, despite the fact that your estrogen level on paper might be like dead in the middle of a reference range, it doesn't mean that you're good to go. Like something could be at play. And this is how I feel with high versus low estrogen. I mean, it's a good kind of breakdown of what to sort of look for as a key, I don't know, takeaway, I don't know, signs essentially. In addition, the true cause of gyno, this is a very informative video about all of the stimulatory inputs that kind of cause proliferative breast tissue developments, and it's not just estrogen, there is also um, other stimulating hormones in the body as well as what inhibits their transcriptional activity too with the breast tissue. We get into that as well in this video, and there are uh, more things to consider. 
In addition to that, why you need to get a sensitive assay estradiol test using liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry rather than a electrochemiluminescence radio immunoassay, because that is something that will be inaccurate as fuck if you don't get um, LCMS testing. Very, very prudent that you get that done, in my opinion, if you're a male or a female, to be honest. Um, so now circling back to the actual study I wanted to go to, the reason why this is such a good study is because it assesses literally castrated men using testosterone gel replacement, but also with a aromatase inhibitor and without an aromatase inhibitor. So the elimination of variables is accomplished through this GnRH agonist by essentially pseudo castrating these individuals and allowing you to actually assess through exact manual manipulation of hormones in the body, what happens when you eliminate estrogen from the equation with your testosterone still there, and then when you let your estrogen, you know, get to where it would otherwise physiologically spit out, you know, what amount of estradiol from aromatization from the testosterone you're administering, what exactly happens? So in this study, the current approaches to diagnosing testosterone deficiency do not consider the physiologic consequences of various testosterone levels or whether deficiencies of testosterone, estradiol, or both account for clinical manifestations. So again, people think too, when it's like the erection is poor quality or their sexual, I don't know, function slash libido is hindered or whatever, like it's tied to your testosterone directly. And yeah, in a way, part of it is, but also estradiol, a very, very direct determinant of sexual function, quality of life. Like if you have crashed estrogen, estrogen, even if your testosterone is through the fucking roof, you will feel like shit. Everything in life will feel gray. You will have ED, you will literally cease to care about sexual intercourse. Like it's that intense. And I've talked about many times the story of uh, when I took letrozole to try and like dry out to get as lean looking as physically possible at the end of an aggressive cut and how I literally stopped talking to uh, the girls I was seeing at the time. I mean, this was, you know, a long time ago, but um, it was like, I literally just ceased to give a fuck about females. I was just like, all right, like no need to continue these relationships because I don't care about female interactions anymore. I am just going to cease sexual function entirely and my dick will only function for urination at this point. That was how you, I felt at the time. All right, so here, methods. We provided 198 healthy men, 20 to 50 years of age with gosorelin acetate to suppress endogenous testosterone and estradiol. Now, as far as what gosorelin is, this is a gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist. So this, like GNRH, you probably are more familiar with the acronym, but that is the acronym for um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. And that goes to your pituitary, stimulates the release of luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, which goes down to your testes to stimulate intratesticular testosterone production as well as uh, spermatogenesis. And basically this gosorelin stuff is an analog. It's synthetic. It's almost like an HCG like how that mimics LH to some extent, like that's what it does, but this is kind of like the GNRH equivalent of that. So HCG trying to mimic LH, gosorelin or things like, um, you know, tryptorelin. Um, these are things that will mimic GNRH and stimulate the same receptor. So basically when it actually binds to the GNRH receptor cells in the pituitary gland, it causes the initial surge in luteinizing hormone, but, after that initial surge, you have a subsequent downregulation effect of it, which actually results in castration. Yes, this is why you you may have heard of tryptorelin, how you need to be extremely careful with its use because you may end up castrating yourself. That's the intensity of this, these GnRH synthetic analogs. Like that's, you know, when they try to castrate like a sex offender or some shit, they would traditionally use things like this in order to castrate them. So very, very, you know, sketchy medications to be fucking around with. Obviously they do what they're intended to do, but over, you know, over stimulation of the, um, this receptor complex can indeed lead to down regul regulation, which subsequently leads to a crash after that subsequent spike in LH and FSH production. So basically they wanted to rule out any kind of, you know, in confounding factors essentially. So. Here they have a random assignment to receive placebo gel or 1.25 grams, 2.5 grams, 5 grams, or 10 grams of testosterone gel daily for 16 weeks. Another 202 healthy men received the GnRH agonist, placebo gel or testosterone gel, and anastrozole to suppress the conversion of test to estradiol. Changes in percentage of body fat and lean mass are the primary outcome. Subcutaneous and intra-abdominal fat 
areas, thigh muscle area and strength, and sexual function were also assessed. So jumping down to cohort one, we have the effects of testosterone without aromatase inhibition. So these are just guys getting test gel in whichever dose they were assigned. Percentage body fat increased significantly in men who received zero grams, 1.25 grams, or 2.5 grams of testosterone daily, as compared with men who received five grams daily, and it decreased significantly in men who received 10 grams of testosterone daily as compared with each other, each of the other groups. So reason for this is if you have less than what you would naturally produce, you are going to experience a regression actually. And this is where we see the traditional graded dose response study. Um, I'll put up a card to exactly how much muscle does zero, 25 milligrams, 50 milligrams, 125 milligrams, 300 milligrams, 600 milligrams of injected testosterone and anthate, how much muscle do you gain? That study is the most like informative of all the studies in terms of body composition outcomes from graded dose response to testosterone exogenously, even up to like over like literal cycle territory blast dosages. In that study, you basically saw the first few cohorts were losing muscle mass, even though they were on like TRT, it's because they were using a dose that was less androgen receptor stimulation um, than they were getting from their natural testosterone. So if you administer, you know, 50 milligrams of tests per week after cleaving off the ester, the amount of freely circulating hormone in your body still like, you might end up with a total T of like fucking, you know, a few hundred if you're lucky. Like you, you have no idea. You might be an individual who's a poor responder too, or has, you know, everyone responds differently in terms of how much testosterone you're going to actually have bioavailable to then use in target tissues and whatnot. And then as expected, once you got up to the, like the, I think it was the 125 milligram mark, obviously there was some level between 50 and 125 where people were like, you know, breaking even. But at 125, they were gaining muscle and losing fat. 300, they were you know significantly gaining muscle and losing fat. And 600, very significantly gaining muscle and losing fat. Same thing here. This is just the test gel, essentially, like comparative version of that kind of a study. So this is graded dose response, essentially. And you saw the, essentially, the dosages that were suboptimal compared to natural production caused a loss of, um, caused fat gain. And then the dosages that were actually super physiological caused fat loss. Lean mass um, decreased significantly in the you know lower dose groups um, as compared with men who received uh, 2.5 grams, 5 grams, or 10 grams daily. So yeah, here, the percentage fat, body fat increased in these guys up to 2.5 grams. Then after that, decreased significantly. So fat loss occurring once dosages actually equate to above baseline, as you would expect. And then lean mass, the same representation that you would expect as well, decreased in men receiving too little of a dose and guys receiving an adequate enough dose to build muscle, you know, gain muscle in a dose dependent manner. Again, diminishing returns on this shit, but dose dependent manner to some extent. Subcutaneous fat area increased by a factor of two to three in men receiving a suboptimal dose as compared with men receiving five to 10 or 10 grams daily. Now, again, once we actually get into the aromatase inhibition component, like that's where shit gets really interesting. So, um, and as expected, you had, you know, leg press strength decreasing in individuals who got placebo, but men who received, you know, an adequate or super physiological dose of test did not have that decrease, of course, like you would expect. And here you had, you know, thigh muscle area decreasing with the too low of dose, increasing significantly with men who received a high enough dose. You know, it's kind of par for the course what you'd expect. But here, effects of testosterone with aromatase inhibition on body composition. So cohort two, percentage of body fat increase in all groups when the aromatase, aromatization of testosterone to estradiol was inhibited. You heard me correctly. In all groups, the same fucking dosages of test, but with estradiol wiped out through aromatase inhibition with an astrazole. The magnitudes of these increases were similar with doses of zero grams, 1.25 grams, 2.5 grams, and five grams of testosterone daily, a finding that suggests a predominantly estrogenic effect. Total body lean mass decreased significantly in men who received placebo as compared with those who received 1.25 2.5 or 10 grams of testosterone daily, finding that implies an independent effect of testosterone. Subcutaneous fat area increased in all groups in cohort two, though only the comparison of changes between the 1.25 and 10 gram dose groups was significant. Increases in intra-abdominal fat area did not differ significantly among the dose groups. Thigh muscle area decreased significantly in men who received placebo as compared with men who received any of the four testosterone doses. As in cohort one, leg press strength declined significantly in men who received placebo as compared with men who received the three highest testosterone doses. So again, you had similar outcomes in some metrics, but again, like some of the fat loss metrics or fat gain metrics, you start to see an interesting contrast with what you have otherwise probably been previously led to believe is like one of the main reasons for, you know, 
fat not falling off your body. It's like, oh, your estrogen's way too fucking high, bro. Effects of testosterone with and without aromatase inhibition on sexual function. In cohort one, sexual desire decreased progressively with declining testosterone doses from 10 grams to zero grams of testosterone daily. And all dose groups differed significantly from one another, except for the 2.5 and 5 gram dose groups. Erectile function worsened significantly in men who received placebo, as you would expect, um, as compared with men who received testosterone and declined more and more in, uh, more in men who received 1.25 grams of testosterone daily than in men in the three highest dose groups. Cohort two, sexual desire declined significantly in men who received placebo as compared with men in the three highest dose groups and declined more in men who received 1.25 grams of testosterone daily than in men in the two highest dose groups. Erectile function decreased more in men who received placebo than in men who received testosterone. Results for other self-reported measures are available in the supplementary appendix. And finally, comparisons of changes in body composition and sexual function with and without aromatase blockade. Cohort testosterone dose interaction was significant for the percentage of body fat, intra-abdominal fat, uh, subcutaneous fat, sexual desire, and erectile function. These findings indicate that estradiol exerted an independent effect on these variables. In the groups that received testosterone, inhibition of estrogen synthesis as compared with intact estrogen synthesis was associated with significant increases in the percentage of body fat. So again, that's quite paradoxical to what most people, a lot of people probably think. You know, these findings indicate estradiol exerted independent effects, group that received testosterone, inhibition of estrogen as compared to leaving it intact, increases in body fat. So inhibiting estrogen increases body fat. Like this is, you know, plain as day, this is a paradoxical, paradoxical outcome than what a lot of us have been taught and led to believe when we were, you know, getting into a lot of this, you know, pharmacology exploration. So anyways, increases in body fat, uh, subcutaneous, intra-abdominal fat, and with significant decreases in sexual desire and erectile function. So across the board, no good. These findings provide additional evidence of an independent effect of estradiol on these measures. The cohort testosterone dose interaction was not significant for totally, total body lean mass, thigh air, muscle area, or leg press strength among the men who received testosterone. There were no significant differences between cohorts in changes from baseline for total body lean mass, thigh muscle area, or leg press strength. So the more elaborate conclusion, essentially that our finding that estrogens have a fundamental role in the regulation of body fat and sexual function coupled with evidence from prior studies of the crucial role of estrogen in bone metabolism. And again, like cardiovascular health, bone health, these are all things that are largely regulated by satisfactory estrogen receptor signaling. And is also why menopausal women end up having a drastic spike in neurotoxicity, you know, Alzheimer's progression, cardiovascular disease risk goes through the roof, bone mineral degradation, like all of these things skyrocket in menopause when estrogen crashes. And obviously testosterone crashes too, but a lot of these things as we found by isolating variables are dictated by adequate estrogen receptor activation. So estrogen deficiency is largely responsible for some of the key consequences of male hypogonadism and suggests that measuring estradiol might be helpful in assessing the risk of sexual dysfunction, bone loss, or fat accumulation in men with hypogonadism. For example, in men with serum testosterone levels of 200 to 400 nanograms per deciliter, sexual function or sexual desire scores decreased by 13% if estradiol levels were 10 picograms per milliliter or more, and by 31% of estradiol levels were below 10 picograms per milliliter. So this is a pretty, like, hypogonadal a lot of times is quantified at like 250 or less on paper. 400, you know, there are certain individuals that might thrive or do okay at 400, you know, it's not necessarily the norm. However, this is like a physiologic, like normal-ish level. But you note that all of a sudden these like factors of quality of life essentially deteriorate when estradiol levels are below a certain threshold that is indicative of either, you know, aromatase inhibition or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing at the estrogen level to inhibit this process. Not ideal. Our findings also suggest that treatment with aromatizable androgens would be preferable to treatment with non-aromatizable androgens in most men with hypogonadism. So of note though, the study has limitations. First, to avoid clinically significant changes in healthy men, such as bone loss, the study was limited to 16 weeks because changes in body composition may progress over time. Greater changes might've been seen at higher testosterone and estradiol levels if gonadal steroids had been suppressed for over a longer period of time. Second, although most circulating estradiol is derived from aromatization of circulating testosterone, small portion is directly secreted by the testes in normal men and may not be restored with exogenous testosterone administration. That's where something like a HCG may be a viable alternative um, for men who do not have like actual gonadal failure as a result of 
lack of response to gonadotropins. So HCG is like, like, there's a reason why certain guys get better libido outcomes and whatnot from HCG or, you know, recombinant LH with FSH or, you know, just actual endogenous analogs, essentially, synthetic analogs of actual gonadotropins relative to using like just straight up testosterone administrations because stuff does happen locally in the testes that is important for sexual function and whatnot, as well as like neurosteroid production and stuff. These are things that are going to be not maxed out or optimized properly when you're using just straight up test. And that's not to say that you can't get away with straight up tests like tons of men do. You know, that's personally what I'm using right now. But HCG, it's like clear or, you know, HMG, recombinant LHFSH. These are things that literally can replicate natural function again, pending that your testi testicles will actually respond accordingly to the adequate gonadotropin analog induced stimulation. So... Like again, if you have like literal testicular failure, obviously HCG is not going to do shit. Third, changes in in uh, changes induced by aromatase inhibi inhibition could primarily reflect the effects on local aromatase activity. Therefore, circulating estradiol levels may not reflect estrogen effects reliably. So yeah, like obviously this is a tissue specific thing too. So you have like actual local aromatization into the hormone estrogen in your brain, your heart, your like everywhere. So just because you have a certain amount circulating in your blood, it is not necessarily representative of what is going on in every tissue in the body because you can't measure like, you know, like brain estrogen levels. You're not going to take a fucking biopsy of your brain to see what your brain estrogen levels are necessarily. So um, you go by blood you can use it as a proxy though. And we see general trends when numbers are at a certain level versus another certain level. And you can at least compare it to your total T levels as well and get certain metrics that are relevant and worthwhile to evaluate in my opinion. So again, like this is, they're just covering all their bases to explain why this is not like, like ideally you would have like a fucking biopsy of every tissue in the body and then show what the actual local activity of these hormones is. But obviously that's not a reproducible thing. Changes seen in our model of acute gonadal steroid deprivation may also differ from those seen when gonadal steroids decline gradually over a period of years. Finally, it seems likely that the relationship between declining gonadal steroid levels and the risk of adverse consequences is more accurately represented as a continuum than as a rigid threshold above which clinical measures are normal and below which adverse changes occur. However, clinicians ultimately must decide how to treat each patient on the basis of his individual data, of which the testosterone level is generally the principal component. In summary, we conducted a dose ranging study to determine the relative testosterone doses and associated serum levels at which body composition, strength, and sexual function initially decline by examining these relationships with and without suppression of estrogen synthesis, we found that lean mass, muscle size, and strength are regulated by androgens. Fat accumulation is primarily a consequence of estrogen deficiency, and sexual function is regulated by both androgens and estrogens. Delineation of the degrees of hypogonadism at which undesirable consequences develop and of the relative roles of androgens and estrogens in each outcome should facilitate the development of more rational approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of hypogonadism in men. And obviously, in case you're curious, this is worthwhile to touch on too, is what these testosterone gel administrations actually yielded in terms of nanogram per deciliter total test levels. So to actually reach what I would consider to be like reasonable physiologic levels, um, you know, five grams seems, you know, like the amount that most men, you know, did uh, reasonably well with when it comes to total T yield, um, with 10 being like, you know, the optimized, like borderline super physiological male, essentially. But again, this is going to boil down to individual dose response and individual response to how you cleave hormones, how your body responds for fast acting versus long acting testosterone administrations with esters versus gel. Like all this shit plays into it and your total serum level, regardless if it looks good on paper, it looks not perfect and optimized on paper. Like maybe you end up with like a perpetually red line sympathetic nervous system when you are way too close to a thousand and your sleep gets fucked up and it actually inhibits quality of life and health versus a guy that you would have been, maybe you would have been better off at closer to 600. Like, or the, this guy, maybe he doesn't have adequate androgen receptor activation at this level and he needs, you know, closer to 1000 nanograms per deciliter to feel symptom relief. Like everyone differs and this is ultimately like a range at the end of the day and nothing is definitive, but this is just a metric of assessment and a proxy for kind of like ballparking where shit is reasonable. So keep that in mind, but this is a good point to make because a lot of these gram, you know, 
mentions, like when we hear milligrams of, of injection, we're kind of more familiar with it without seeing the nanogram per deciliter actual serum equivalent. But here with testosterone gel, like most guys probably aren't familiar with what actually yielded adequate levels. So when you're hearing like muscle loss or like fat gain and stuff with dosages around here, like you can kind of see why now when you see what these are actually yielding, you know, like we had levels, estradiol levels that are like barely physiologic until you hit um, like 2.5 is like fucking still like really bottom of the barrel and five, we're getting close to 20. And then only once you get to 10, you're almost at like, you know, the top of the traditional reference range essentially. And of course with aromatase inhibition, you have a complete wiping out nearly of all aromatase activity essentially, at least aromatase activity interacting with the testosterone to produce estradiol. So anyway, serum testosterone levels and nanograms per deciliter, we had 2.5 nearing, you know, like, I don't know, 380-ish, five getting to, you know, closer to 500 or so, and then 10 grams at achieving like a 800 nanogram per deciliter total essentially. So ultimately the takeaway from this is that estrogen fulfills roles that may have otherwise been overlooked entirely in terms of sexual function, cardiovascular health, brain health, bone health, also fat loss outcomes something that goes completely overlooked in my opinion. You often think that the way to go about a fat loss phase, I've seen a lot of guys crush estrogen throughout their entire cutting phases or contest preps because they think that is inhibiting their fat loss when in reality it's the fucking opposite. This is something that you need to facilitate adequate fat loss as well as you know other downstream cascades like growth factor production with your IGF-1 and whatnot. Like These things are all intertwined and having a actual estradiol level that is representative of the amount of testosterone, like actual comparable proportionally would be ideal. Like if you're using a certain dose of test, you know, inhibiting your estrogen to like 15 picograms per milliliter, because on paper that looks like the sweet spot in the reference range or 20 or 22 or whatever it is, but your test is like fucking 2,500 nanograms per deciliter or more. Like, does that make a whole lot of sense? Like, obviously there are certain scenarios though, where individuals get gynecomastia development from a certain dose of testosterone, even at TRT dosages, like we're not just talking about bodybuilder shit. Using TRT, they end up with, you know, gynecomastia development. In puberty, they had gyno from literal just fucking puberty, in which case there are unique, more targeted approaches to things like aromatase inhibition when you have like a genetically odd outlier, like excess of activity, or you have way too much fat and, you know, you are producing more aromatase than the next guy and it causes more estrogen to be produced as a consequence. These are all like outlier scenarios and should be considered like the aromatase inhibition is not something that has no utility. It definitely is very, very specific and has targeted applications that definitely make sense for certain individuals in certain scenarios. But in general, when it comes to TRT replacement, most guys would be better off going to like a micro dose daily administration schedule, reducing the burden on their body from their administration to not have a super physiological spike with a concurrent super physiological amount of aromatization happening concurrently and going to a more endogenous kind of like representation of natural function route with, you know, daily administrations of micro doses that would be something that would be way more, I don't know, responsible in my opinion than jumping immediately to the anastrozole route because you see how this affects you. It's not necessarily a positive thing. If you could achieve the same outcome with symptom relief, with lifestyle intervention, sleep hygiene, like again, like I think even melatonin might have interactions with fucking gyno attenuation to some extent. Perhaps I'm forgetting, maybe I'm misremembering on that, but like things like circadian rhythms and like natural endogenous hormone cascades are definitely, they need to be there for adequate estrogen receptor signaling where it's not excessive and you're not, you know, having a hard time uh, actually metabolizing the estrogens out of your body too. Um, some of the exposure to some of the, you know, synthetic chemicals and shit that we unfortunately are disproportionately exposed to nowadays, you know, being mindful of those things, endocrine disruptors, all that kind of, there's a lot of stuff to consider at the end of the day, but it is worthwhile, I think, before you haphazardly jump on like a lifelong anastrozole concurrent treatment with your TRT or with whatever you're doing, you evaluate all of the natural interventions that could be appropriate alternatives before you go that route, because Oftentimes, if you are not somebody who actually like literally clinically has no fucking choice and needs it that badly, you're going to end up with deteriorated outcomes in certain metrics that you might otherwise want to avoid. So I thought it was worthwhile to elucidate the importance of estrogen, not just from a, I don't know, like, uh, 
like what aspects do men even understand what estrogen is good for? I guess in general, if you watch my channel, you, you're probably aware of most of that, some of these factors, but the average person who is on TRT, they get just like a cookie cutter protocol prescribed to them with HCG, TRT, and Astrazole, and they get kicked out the door because they're just getting their markup on medications at the clinic, and they don't give a shit about staying up to date on the literature or anything like that, or optimizing the patient's quality of life, health, because yeah, like if you're low T and you get on all of that shit, you're probably gonna have a better state of quality of life above baseline, even with this suboptimal, you know, aromatase inhibition component added in. Like I've literally seen prescriptions where you have like one milligram per milliliter of an astrazole like compounded into the fucking test. Like that kind of stuff is, is absolutely mind boggling to me. So anyways, this is hopefully some elucidation of the importance of not just testosterone, but also estrogen. And, um, you know, not indiscriminately inhibiting it unless like absolutely warranted and, you know, going about different ways of attenuating um, estrogen issues should they crop up without just haphazardly jumping on a super high dose of like an aromatase inhibitor. So anyways, hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully you le learned something. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplaysmartates.com. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplaysmartates, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below, including my preventative medicine and hormone replacement therapy platform, where we connect you with high quality doctors, providers who represent this same quality of information, stay up to date on all of this literature and understand it inside out. And you can be assured that they won't haphazardly throw you on a laundry list of shit that makes no sense. They will evaluate your diagnostics and your individual situation. And instead of cookie cutter prescribing you something that every single other patient got, they will actually make appropriate protocol recommendations, even from a natural perspective, in order to optimize your quality of life, performance, vitality, Etc. This is again like we deal with naturals too. This is not just if you're going to be on TRT, like people who just want to look at their blood work, look at their diagnostics, get a high quality doctor in their camp who's looking out for their best interests. You know, we evaluate all options, and this may include circling back to things like diet, lifestyle, sleep hygiene before you jump on TRT. Even if you think you're low T, maybe you're just like fucking hyper stressed and your sleep sucks. Like, this is not uncommon. Guys end up on a TRT regimen for life because another clinic that has a cookie cutter way of diagnosing and prescribing and just wants to get the, you on the meds, that's how they do it. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's pretty fucking common. So, Anyways, you can check that out if you want high quality uh, medical oversight or just to uh, you know check your own labs too. You can do that. We have a um, self-service labs builder where you can you know get pre-designed panels that have been audited by me and approved, or you can you know create your create your own panel individually, pick your own biomarkers from scratch, and it's pretty cost-effective compared to other labs. And we actually offer high sensitivity testing like estradiol, LCMS, MS that you can add individually. You could literally check out with one biomarker if you want, rather than be forced to buy like a $400 panel, which you might at another you know, lab offering company, because a lot of them to get the actual labs you want, like if you want one certain metric, like a free DHT, you know, or something like that, or a free test with equilibrium dialysis, you're forced to get like $700 of other shit. That is not the case with us. You can individually add whatever biomarker you want you want to your cart. So you can check that out as well as anything else I'm associated with. It's all in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.